It's my pleasure to uh, be here with Elon Musk. Uh, Jane uh, provided, I thought, a, a great introduction, but I just wanted to add one more thing uh, before we get to questions. Um, w when Elon was 23, he, uh, he got out of college, he went to San Francisco, the Bay Area, with a car, a computer, and uh, $2,000. I think yeah. that's right. Uh, and he started a company called Zip2. It was sort of like what the early Yahoo was. It was an online directory. Four years later, uh, when he was about my age, he sold the company for just over $300 million to Compaq. And um, I bring this up not because it was the largest internet company acquisition at the time, but because he's done so much stuff since then that nobody even remembers this, <laughs> <laughs> this initial True. success. True, Zip2 doesn't get much play. <laughs> So um, I'm going to ask him some questions. We're going to go through. He's got, you know, as Jane said, three mind-blowing companies. And then hopefully we'll have some time for you all to ask him some questions. Uh, so start thinking, and uh, we'll get to those. So um, I'm going to put up something that probably looks familiar to most people here. Um, this is the homepage of PayPal in 2000. Elon was a co-founder. And uh, the company was sold to eBay in 2002 for $1.5 billion. And uh, we all know what PayPal is today, but I was hoping you could sort of share with us kind of what your vision was from the beginning. Uh, well, it certainly evolved over time. Um, initially, the, uh, I, well, I, after selling Zip2, I, wa I, I wanted to do something more on the internet, and it seemed to me that there hadn't been all that much innovation in the financial sector. Um, and given that money is kind of a, just an entry in a database, and it was low bandwidth, it would, so it wouldn't, didn't require some big infrastructural upgrade to the internet, uh, it seemed it should lend itself to innovation. Um, so I try to think of what could be, uh, you know, what was something compelling that could be done. And uh, I thought, well, if we can combine all, all types of financial services in one, uh, so you could have like mortgages, like basically all your, your entire financial relationship seamlessly integrated together in one place online, that would be cool. And then there was a little feature that just seemed like an obvious feature, which was the ability to transfer money from one uh, person to another by, by entering a unique identifier like an uh, email address. Um, that was like just a sort of a little feature, but then whenever we demonstrate the product, um, people would, wouldn't get excited about the consolidated financial services, but they would get excited about emailing money. So we started focusing our, our energy on that, and that really ended up being the big driver of growth. Right. So it sort of went from a super bank, uh, I think that's what the media called like, it. Yeah, at the like time. a super financial services thing. Yeah. Um, to, to really narrowly focusing on uh, email payments. So, so Although I should point out that actually a lot of people aren't aware that um, a lot of the success of PayPal is due to the underlying financial services that are there, such as the Money Market Fund, uh, which is one of the highest yielding, in fact, I think the highest yielding in the country, um, and the fact that there's a PayPal debit card, yeah. that's a, which operates off the MasterCard system, so you can, you have, you can buy things, um, you know, buy things in the real world um, and get cash from an ATM that directly taps into your, into your PayPal account. Those are actually very important to the PayPal business model. Right. So you were CEO of the company for, uh, I, for most of 2000, I think. And yeah. you went. And 99, yeah. And 99. So, so like two years, basically. PayPal merged, uh, or, or sorry, Elon's company merged with another company. Cook, yeah. It became PayPal. Right. He was running the company. Uh, he went on an investment raising trip. And when he got back, <laughs> what happened? Well, <clears throat> yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's not a good idea to leave the office <laughs> when there are like a lot of major things uh, underway which are causing people a great deal of stress. Yeah. Um, uh, but it was a combination of uh, needing to raise money and uh, I had not, I'd gotten married earlier that year and not had any vacation or honeymoon or anything, so it was kind of a combined financing trip slash honeymoon. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, but away for two weeks, um, and there was just so much, there was just a lot of worry, um, and that, that caused uh, uh, the management team to decide that I wasn't the right guy to run the company. Um, and. Uh, uh, and so the board was like, you know, geez, what do we do? So basically, I could, I could afford it really hard, but yeah. instead I said, you know, rather than fight it at this critical time, uh, best to sort of concede. It, it's amazing to me how you managed, w w when I first asked you about this, you said you buried their hatchet. <laughs> and, uh, 
and, and you know, one of the, basically the person who replaced you just put, I think, $20 million or so into your company. And yeah. how did you get past that kind of betrayal? I mean, how did you, how did you guys patch it up? Yeah, uh, that's actually an interesting story. Um, well, I, well, I didn't agree with that conclusion. I understood why they took the action they did. Um, and they're not, you know, um, Peter and Max and David and the other guys, not, I mean, they're smart people um, with generally the right motivations. They did what they thought was, was right, and I think for the right reasons, I mean, except that the reasons w weren't valid, um, <laughs> in my opinion. But um, uh, it's hard to argue with the ultimate outcome, which is, which, which is positive. So, right. um, you know, I just thought, you know, it's just easy to um, be better and, and, uh, and, and have, I just hate them forever. Uh, but you know, it's best uh, that the right, better course of action is to turn the other cheek and and sort of um, you know make make the relationship good, and, and it, it was. You know, but I, I put a lot of effort into sort of making things good, and yeah. um, and then yeah, uh, actually recently, uh, the Founders Fund, which is comprised primarily of ex PayPal people, including Peter, uh, who replaced me as CEO, invested in SpaceX. Yeah, and, and I invested in Peter's things before right. that. So uh, I, I want to put up something about <coughs> what this, uh, you know, PayPal sale to eBay helped make possible. Uh, tell, us, tell us what we're looking at. Uh, that's the Tesla Roadster, which is uh, the world's first production electric sports car. And uh, t how much does it cost? How fast <coughs> sure. does it? Give us the uh, sales pitch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They just opened a dealership, so he should be good at this. Um, yeah, uh, uh, actually, I've sold a lot of cars. Um, <laughs> so the Tesla Roadster is uh, the, 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 the nutshell, the, you know, the elevator speech thing is uh, that the Roadster is faster than a Ferrari and more efficient than a Prius. Um, so it actually has better acceleration than any Ferrari except the Enzo. Um, and it's about 3.9 seconds, zero to 60. Um, and that, that actually understates the true acceleration because uh, zero to 60 for a gasoline car is measured from when the wheels start moving, but the wheels only start moving when you engage the clutch. And it typically takes about a quarter second or more to engage the clutch, but there's no clutch in, in, for our car. It's uh, direct drive, um, so you don't have a clutch engagement delay. So it's, it's like a gasoline car with a zero to 60 of about 3.6 seconds. Um, and uh, it's good, incredibly good handling. Um, and then the, the, the energy efficiency of the car is, is, is probably the most amazing thing. Um, it only costs $4 at current California rates to go to about 250 miles. So the, the, the range, the current uh, EPA rated range, which is a combination of highway and city with the air conditioning on, is 244 miles. So, <laughs> it's amazing. So, this is, I mean, it's so cool. It costs $109,000 yeah. if anybody's it's, interested. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's expensive, but it's comparable to like a Porsche 911, right. uh, you know. So we wanted to have something which was in the price range of a, of a comparable gasoline car that it could, you know, probably beat. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so that's, that's key because, you know, it's one thing to have a, a compelling product, but it has to be a compelling product at a compelling price. Right. You, uh, in, in the press, obviously, this, this has gotten a lot of attention, and Elon's taken a lot of flack uh, for various redesigns. It, you've sort of been, you've been portrayed as a uh, micromanager, you know, redesigning the headlights or whatever. Um, I thought it was a nanomanager. <laughs> 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 I've improved several orders of magnitude. So, why, why does the car need to be perfect? I mean, why well, did you need to redesign, you know, the doors, for instance? Well. First of all, the car is definitely not perfect. Okay. Um, uh, in fact, I, th one of the things that, that troubles me personally is like when I see a product, I, it, it sort of, I can immediately see a readout of all the flaws. Yeah. Um, I need to reprogram myself or remind myself to like look at the good things as well. Um, so it's certainly far from perfect, but the, 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 the acceptance, I mean, fundamentally, if you don't have a, a compelling product, um, at a compelling price, you don't have a great company, um, and that that was really my the gate, the, the gate that the, the, the product the car had to pass through. Um, and so there were things like um, the door sills, because we we used a uh, a chassis that was inherited from Lotus Elise, 
Um, in retrospect, we should have completely redesigned the car um, and, not, and not used any uh, Elise uh, componentry because we really, it's, it's sort of like you go into a house and you think you'll just change this or that and, and it'll be all okay and then you end up changing everything in the house. It would have been better to just level the house and start and yeah. do something new. Um, because the car, our car is 30% heavier, the, the, the load points are all different, so we had to really redesign the chassis. And um, one of the things I said we've got to do is to lower the dorsals. Um, and, and as it is, our dorsals are still too high, but if, I'd say, imagine if they're two inches higher, because that's yeah. what they were. It made it, it made it almost unusable in my view. Yeah, I mean, the, what, what Elon, I think you were quoted saying uh, something like, DeLorean failed because uh, yeah, it, it, they we, built a bad car. And, yes. and you need to, the car needs to be worth $109,000 to absolutely, make it Absolutely, absolutely, exactly. Uh, if you don't, exactly, we did not want to create another DeLorean. And the DeLorean kind of looked kind of cool, but it was a, a w really weak on, on performance. Yeah. It was unreliable, um, and there were lots of little issues with the car. Yeah. And we just didn't want to be in that situation. And it's not like, I mean, we could have built a worse car and still sold a bunch of them. But if you don't sell enough to make, it, make the business look attractive to future investors, you're not going to attract the capital to take it to the next level or even to sustain where it is. H how many orders have you taken? So 1,200 1200 deposits. Wow. So we, we, we only take uh, orders when somebody puts down a deposit of at least $5,000. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to move to another company, but uh, you told me that the last successful car startup was Jeep in 1941. Yeah, in, in the U.S., yeah. In the U.S. So doesn't that kind of say something bad about going into the car business? I mean, why, why go for this? Um, well, it certainly I would not have done this if it were a gasoline car. Um, so this is not about, it's not because I thought the world had a shortage of sports cars that yeah. we started, started Tesla. It's because it's very important that we accelerate the transition away from gasoline um, you know, for environmental reasons, for economic reasons, for national security reasons. Um, it's very, very fundamental. Um, and frankly, yeah, so, so, so you know, it, even, even if you don't think, believe in the environmental reasons, even if you don't believe in the national security issues, reasons, it's obviously gasoline, oil is, is not a renewable resource. Um, and sooner or later, uh, the economic issues are going to cause a collapse of the economy, literally a collapse of the economy, if, if we don't uh, find, find an alternative, because you'll be paying $20, 30 40 of gas, uh, for gasoline, and the stuff's going to get, you know, it's, it's going to start approaching the price of gold. I mean, yeah. it's, it's going to be crazy. Um, so uh, we've we got to find uh, a, a renewable alternative. And the, the, the good that Tesla is doing is not just Tesla's uh, what, what Tesla does itself, it's the example that Tesla sets for the rest of the industry. In fact, people have probably seen the announcement for the Chevy Volt. Um, well, Bob Lutz, uh, the, Bob Lutz is the champion of the, the Chevy Volt, and he credits Tesla with, the, with, with, with starting the, get, getting the Chevy Volt started because when we unveiled our Tesla Roadster uh, a couple of years ago, and he, and he saw the press release, uh, he took the Tesla press release, went to his development guys and said, if a little company in California can do this, why can't we? Yeah. Um, and that's what prompted the Chevy Volt. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about how we power these things. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a picture of the workshop in, uh, in San, or just south of San Francisco, right? And then uh, this is another company that Elon, this is probably the one that you're maybe least involved with on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. but it's, uh, it's Solar City. And um, sort of the elevator pitch for this one, is, as you've told it to me before, is you know, you're going to do for solar power what Dell did for computers which I yeah, think is such a, a nice way of putting it, and I was hoping you could just <coughs> unpack that for us a little bit. Certainly. Well, um, Dell doesn't make the CPU or the hard drive or the memory, but they put it all together, um, and they manage the relationship with the end customer, uh, and they manage the service and, and, and all that, and it, that's a very important element, um, because if, if you had to go to uh, Intel and buy your CPU and somewhere else and buy your you know, hard drive and put that all together. It, very few people would have computers. Yeah. Um, so SolarCity is about packaging that or making it really easy to use. Uh, or just basically make one call. It's just seamless and painless. Um, and then they also have a lot of innovation on the financing front. So they did a, a $300 million debt facility with uh, Morgan Stanley um, that allows the, the end consumer to, to sign up for solar power, put no money down, and your utility bill decreases. So it's a, a complete no-brainer. 
Um, now, it doesn't work for every house because your house has to be, you know, uh, south face, you know, have a, have a south facing roof and be of sufficient size, and, and you have to be in an area where electricity is not super cheap. Yeah. Um, but it works for a lot of, a lot of houses, and, uh, you know, maybe a third, probably a third of the houses in California, something like that. Um, and so they, they've just enjoyed phenomenal growth. I mean, they're literally growing as fast as they can hire good people. Um, and, uh, I mean, the numbers for the month of August came in, and Solar City is as big as the next five solar power providers combined in California. Mm -hmm. So, and, and all credit to them. I mean, really, it's a phenomenal job. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was sort of weighing every now and again, like, yeah, what, how about this, or how about that? But really, uh, I deserve very little credit for no, Solar No City. nano managing there. No, not at all. Yeah. Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> so, uh, Jane uh, brought up Mars in her introduction. And, uh, you know, you got out of PayPal with, and Zip2, you know, with, with a lot of money. And uh, I think, I'm sure people in this room have had this happen to them, and, and many people will have it happen sometime in the future, I hope. Um, and instead of buying mutual funds or, I don't know, doing what everyone does with several hundred million dollars, uh, you decided to... <laughs> <laughs> A mortgage-backed uh, securities, I think they're, <laughs> they're great. <laughs> you, uh, you decided to start a rocket company with the express purpose of, well, making uh, it cheaper to get stuff in outer space and then eventually um, going to Mars, uh, or helping humanity go to Mars. And, and I just wanted to know, you know, why? Why do that? <laughs> <laughs> it isn't obvious. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, well, when I was in college, there were sort of three areas that I, I, I sort of thought, of, what, what's really going to affect the future of humanity in a significant way? The three things that seemed to be most significant to me were the internet, uh, the transition to a sustainable energy economy, and the third was the extension of life beyond Earth, becoming multi-planetary. Um, I didn't think I'd be involved in, at all in option three, um, but uh, you know, the reason I think it's important is it, is it goes to the, how we decide that anything is important. And the lens of history is a good way to distinguish what seems important in the moment from what is truly important over the long term. Um, and if you zoom out and look at a long enough period of time, <coughs> say the four billion year history of Earth uh, and the evolution of life itself, then there's only about half a dozen or so major milestones uh, in, in the you know, history of life. There's obviously single-celled life, multicellular life, differentiation to plants and animals, uh, the transition from uh, oceans to land, um, uh, mammals, consciousness. And so. Uh, and then also on that scale would fit life becoming multi-planetary. Um, it would be, I think, at least as important as life going from the oceans to land, and probably more important or more significant, because at least that, that was a gradual transition. If, you didn't, if, you, if, if, land was, if things got a little uncomfortable on land, you could just hop back in the ocean. Um, and that's not really feasible on interplanetary journeys. Um, so... You know, here we are, it's sort of the first time in the four billion year history of Earth that life has been able to go beyond Earth. And that, that window may be open for a long time, and I'm optimistic that, I hope it will, and I'm actually fairly optimistic about the future of Earth. Um, but uh, something may happen that, that closes that window and, pre and prevents, us, prevents life from extending beyond Earth. Um, and that risks the extension of life, or at least consciousness as we know it. Um, and that would be a terrible thing. Yeah. Life is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give people a sense of, of what kind of we're talking about. So we just have a short, oh, this is, you know, building the rocket, and this should give people a sense of it. So that's your rocket, and, and, and that launched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that launched, uh, what, about three, three weeks ago or four weeks ago? Yeah. Um, and I, we'll get to what happened, but I just want to ask you I mean, watching that, and, and, and when you watched that for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, the first, your first rocket went in 05, I, I believe. Or, right. I mean, how did that, how did you feel when, you know, $100 million 
years of work, and you know, you're shooting something you know, in the air. I mean, it must have been amazing. Yeah, it's pretty nerve-wracking, that's for sure. <laughs> um, the, the pucker factor on launch day is very high. <laughs> um, so, no, I, you know, something that, well, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm actually, should be said, I'm actually kind of like a physics guy. I mean, I'm like an engineer, really, and I, I do kind of the business stuff because, uh, you know, you kind of have to do the business stuff, um, or if you don't do the business stuff, somebody else is going to do it for you, and then you, then you could be in trouble. Um, and uh, I'm actually the chief designer of the rocket. I mean, I could tell you, I could redraw that rocket without the, without the benefit of blueprints for the most part. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of like seeing my baby go up there, you know. Um, and it's it's pretty scary. Yeah. Um, so so there have been three flights so far, and, and each one is, has, obviously the goal is to get into orbit. Each one has sort of not made it. Um, how did you deal with the... Well, we got to space. Okay, you got to space, but it, it yeah. didn't... You, you didn't get where you wanted to go. Not all the way. Um. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you know, so, but, you but didn't I'm, necessarily go all the way on the first few dates. SpaceX so. has... <laughs> <laughs> you got to work your way up there. <laughs> um, so, uh, it, but it, certainly flights two and three got to... Well into well beyond the boundaries of space, um, it didn't get to full orbital velocity though. Yeah, but I mean, you've got <coughs> SpaceX has several hundred employees, uh, and and obviously you said it was like your baby. I mean, how did you deal with it personally, and then how did you deal with the company a, a, as a manager, sort of helping them get past it and and helping your customers get past it, obviously to to, to keep their money, because nobody's taken their money out of uh, right. SpaceX. They've sold 12 flights, and none of the customers have asked for their money back. That's true. So how did you do that? Um, lots of therapy, <laughs> uh, lots of hand-holding. Uh, no, it, it was just, um, I, I think um, the customers that are that have signed up for SpaceX are pretty sophisticated. Um, they understand that um, in the early in you know, early attempts at flight, uh, you know, in the development phase, essentially, the, we call it the beta phase if it was software, um, there will be crashes um, and things, things won't initially go 100%. Um, they obviously do expect that once we get out of the development phase <coughs> that uh, there will be good reliability. Um, and that really is a function of eliminating design-related issues. Yeah. Um, you know, the last launch uh, had a problem because we had a, a brand new engine on it uh, that had a a, thr a, th a thrust transient that was longer than the last one, and uh, so there was an issue of following stage separation. Right. Um, but generally, they're quite sophisticated customers, and they, um, they understand what's going on. And, and actually, the first uh, three flights were uh, paid for by, well, the first two were paid for by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, and the third one was paid for by the uh, Air Force uh, Operation Response for Space Office. And their outcome, the outcomes they were looking for were not really the, the delivery of a satellite to, to orbit. They were actually looking for demonstration of rapid launch. Right. And Which so they actually them. felt that, that we were fully paid for three flights. Right. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, we'll have some time for a quick Q&A. Um, you know, there's, there's another rocket that looks just like this right now uh, in the Marshall Islands where uh, SpaceX launches from, and it's, I think you told me it's going to go on This on coming Tuesday, week, hopefully. Or hopefully this yeah. week. And... Um, you know, you told me, and I think you've written this uh, elsewhere, um, that starting a rocket company is it's so risky, it's like playing Russian roulette. And uh, Well, each launch is a bit like Russian roulette, yeah. Okay. And, um, but you, you know, you, yeah. Russian roulette, you know, it's worth pointing out that you're probably going to win. <laughs> 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 but, but I wanted to ask you, you know, Russian roulette, you know, how, how do you know that you're dead? I mean, when do you... When do you stop? When do you say, you know what, I've, I'm not going to make it? Or how well, do you know? I think if we run out of money. Um, but uh, we actually, I know this sounds crazy, but we were profitable last year. We're going to be profitable this year. I'm not a big profit. It's, we're a fairly small profit. Uh, and uh, we have enough funding on hand and with existing contracts that are independent of Falcon 1 to last through the end of next year. Okay. So uh, I, I was just told, I guess we don't have time for que questions, and um, I'll let that be my last question. And, okay. But, Elon, thank you so much for being here and um, 
just sharing your story with us. It's, it's so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you.